A whole year has come and gone since prehistoric planet rose to wash the bad taste of Dominion and years of other such crap from our mouths. And now we have a second season. I enjoyed season 1 despite having my clear gripes with it. So is season 2 good? Does it still stand on its own two feet? And does it fix said gripes? And the answers are yes, yes, and mostly. To get into what season 2 did really well, first off, the diversity. Season 1 had a great focus on pterosaurs and marine life, as well as the dinosaurs, but it did distinctly feel like it was only the cute or impressive animals people would recognise as distinctly Mesozoic. Season 2 bucks that, and cranks the taxalist far further. Crocodilians, snakes, mammals, avian birds, ammonites, all with extra embellishments of live-action animals, mean season 2 feels like a more educative look at the diversity of an actual world, rather than Favreau's glorified tech demo. And a lot of these are excellent sequences too. Cretaceous Madagascar in Islands was the episode highlight, with Majungasaurus hunting Samosuchus, Madstoya ambushing a Mashikasaurus, and Adolatherium caring for its young. Similarly, the Ammonite garden scene of Oceans was a beautiful and whimsical scene showing the weirder side, success, and diversity of Ammonites that many may not have known about. It's also nice to see Hesperonis portrayed as an actual bird, like a giant grebe rather than the naked death fowl of the 2000s. The regulars of mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, and pterosaurs also still get plenty of good sequences too. Hatigopteryx gets a generally winning scene showing them as terrestrial hunters far better than the one in season 1. Mosasaurs get a lot of strong scenes showing their diversity, and Phosphorosaurus gets a very nice homage to cruel seas. I also enjoyed the Tyrannosaurus vs Quetzalcoatl scene, that I'm positive the online community will no doubt have a sane, measured, and reasonable response to. Dinosaur diversity in Season 2 picks up a bit as well, and assorted families get a bit more representation. Abelosaurs have done very well, with Majungasaurus and Rajasaurus getting show-stealing scenes, and great designs. The latter in particular getting a pretty dandy Darth Maul colour scheme. There are Pachycephalosaurids, more sauropods, and more ankylosaurs, and they all get at least one scene that ranges from excellent to fine to show off the family in. Ostroraptor is also a very welcome addition to the Dromaeosaurs too, and has a fantastic sequence. The habitats said animals are seen in are also more ambitious than before too. We get a whole episode underwater, of which the whole thing was a highlight. And similarly, the deck and traps sequences were generally exceptional. The march of the Isosaurus is a pretty strong contender for one of the best scenes of both series, with the wonderfully designed sauropods against the active volcanic backdrops. On top of this, dinosaurs also just generally get more to do. A big old hallmark of some recent BBC documentaries that lingered over the first season was that there was a lot of excellent looking shots, always in amazing scenery, with dinosaurs not doing a fat lot. It's a bit like how one of the things said about the first series was how they had dinosaurs not doing things ever seen before, and then giving the example of a T-Rex swimming. Technically correct, but why should I care? There was at least one such scene per episode of dinosaurs looking amazing but doing nothing special, and that's mostly nipped in the bud here. Each scene has some actual meat to it and some purpose. So overall, season 2 comes across as the much more interesting and ambitious program. But does it nip every problem I had in the bud? Not quite. Whilst the scenes of predation and conflict generally have a bit more meat on their bones now, and the Tyrannosaurus hunting the Edmontosaurus was what anyone wanting macro predation could really hope for, some scenes can still skirt around violence in a noticeable way. I criticised the first series for showing a snow leopard hunt instead of showing raptor prey restraint, and was later informed this and other such decisions came from Favreau's personal dislike of graphic animal violence instead of any technical limitations. And this is a disappointment, both in general and when it gets repeated in Season 2. When you see what's being shown of Velociraptor in Season 2, it's pretty much the same scene, one that depicts Velociraptors as keenly intelligent pack hunters. And when all you have new is a physical glow-up, at what point do you have to admit this is just reinforcing what Jurassic Park already taught, albeit with a feathery new design? 
On the topic of scenes that could do with a little more meat on their bones, the fact season 2 has a scene of Tarbosaurus ambushing a herd of sauropods in a desert canyon system, and successfully makes it boring, is quite an achievement. And god forbid herbivores defend themselves on that note too. In a similar vein, some dinosaurs or species also just don't get especially good or informative sequences. Hadrosaurs are one of the most successful dinosaur families of the Cretaceous, and so it'd be no surprise if they were to get a great number of excellent sequences detailing their behaviour and ecology that allowed them to get there. So it is a surprise when they don't. Hadrosaurs get two types of scenes, one to show off the environments, and meat. There's also just a lot of Favreau's family-friendly Disney influence across the board too. There's a lot of cutesy scenes and some goofy slapstick too. Baby dinosaurs squeak and mule like baby mammals, instead of the ratcheting, ear-bleeding screeches of most hungry baby birds. Or just the silence of baby reptiles. And they're all born adorable and semi-precocious instead of like little naked hell beasts people wouldn't want to cuddle. Dinosaurs trip over and bump into each other. The Bezel Bufo does its goofy somersault. It's all very cosy and family-friendly and can feel a bit too much like you're watching Favreau's Jungle Book or Lion King again at times. Nothing is allowed to get too ugly or unpleasant in this. But I will say, luckily it doesn't go too far. I was especially worried in the Pachycephalosaurus and Triceratops scenes that they may try to play some Hollywood David and Goliath hokum, but luckily the more experienced male with far greater mass trashed the upstart, as one would expect. On the BBC front too, things are reasonably toned down. The self-indulgent rotoscopes of old BBC scenes are almost vanquished in season 2, and it's all the better for it, giving way instead for healthy speculation and scenes reminiscent of living animals, without just directly copying existing footage. Many scenes do feel based on direct behaviours, but without being overbearing, and overall a successful balance is struck, for the most part. On a more mixed note, the science and behaviour of dinosaurs. Some of the dinosaurs used have interesting snapshots of behaviour in ecology in the fossil record that aren't represented here in the documentary, and this is really quite confusing. When you get given an interesting fact by the fossil record only to use fanciful speculation instead, that starts getting iffy. Majungasaurus is an example here, a cool dinosaur with a fantastic sequence that felt very real and lifelike, yet most paleo-enthusiasts will know it as the dinosaur with definitive proof of cannibalism. If you're watching this, chances are you know that, but the public, after seeing Majungasaurus's sequence in Prehistoric Planet, probably won't. It still gets a good sequence, but not the most informative one for what we know about it. Tartria also suffers from this. It's very bizarre and possibly telling we get a little extra Apple TV sequence about ankylosaurs using their tail clubs on each other, rather than them doing that in the actual sequence of the proper documentary everyone wanted to watch. But with that said, when in the New Scientist's review they said they wanted more science, I can't help but feel they were a little unfair. There are still good scenes directly based on modern paleontological science that get the making of science bits at the end explaining it. The flaw comes from the fact they only get one of these for the program despite having multiple sequences. And in a sentence I never thought I'd say, maybe Dinosaur Planet had the right idea. If Prehistoric Planet doesn't have a narrative to interrupt, then there technically would be no harm in having more segments like these interspersed throughout the episode and it would allow all sequences with findings directly influencing their scene to show off the homework done for it. Some may still find that immersion breaking though. And now that we're fully in the streaming era and Prehistoric Planet doesn't seem likely to get a terrestrial release, I think the best function could be Amazon Prime's X-Ray format, with the option to have pop-ups to watch additional content and trivia that went into making the final product. But I have no idea if that format is copyrighted or not. But with so much work done for the show, it does undeniably seem a shame only so much of the working out gets shown. And it would be good to draw a line between science and speculation scenes too. But there's one personal problem I had with season 1 that isn't fixed, and is if anything more exacerbated by season 2. And it's the desire for a different format. 
This still sort of fits into the desire for more, if nothing else too. But as I said last year, if you have either scant records or an empty formation, then the planet Earth sequence works best. But Prehistoric Planet doesn't really have this problem, and especially even less so in Season 2. Most of these animals are relatively well-studied species in fully recovered ecosystems. That ultimately left me with a desire to stay more in each one, rather than to zip away to something new. And again, Season 2 really exacerbates this with a return to past locales from Season 1. It really feels like if you took both seasons and chopped them up into their individual segments, you could very easily stitch them together into single location episodes with something of a narrative, and that this would feel like the more cohesive choice. Some episodes like Islands try to have weak narratives, and storylines weren't just by the wayside, as series producer Tim Walker in one interview talked about how there were individual storylines running through each segment. So clearly the idea of a narrative is there. It can feel like some moments were meant to have more impact behind them too. The Alamosaurus bull dying at the start of North America felt like the continuation of a story we never saw, so why not give us that? This doesn't have to use a protagonist format either. Looking into some of the Walking With episodes, the first episode of Walking With Beasts takes place over just 24 hours in the lakeside forest, and whilst the Lectictidium family are technically the protagonist animals, it has a shared focus on a lot of the others too. The family get 5 minutes and 7 seconds of dedicated screen time, less than a minute more than the Gastornis mother and chicks 4 minutes and 42 seconds, and the Ambulocetuses 4 minutes and 12 seconds. Two or all three of them share scenes with equal focus for 3 minutes and 6 seconds. The rest of the runtime is setup, scenery, and other animals without identified individuals. So we can see you can use a format unlike that of Planet Earth, but still maintain a broader focus whilst with a cohesive narrative flow. And something like this could work if people are concerned about an anthropomorphized protagonist, a single location with multiple focuses over a set period of time. Again, this isn't because I just want walking with dinosaurs, but again. It's easy to criticise and difficult to create, but with all the raw materials this show had, it really feels like the option chosen was much more for recreating planet Earth than it being the best choice for the materials used. Or maybe even to try and avoid comparisons to the Walking With series. And this is pointless. Walking With is the genre creator. Its greatest impact lasting long after its accuracy and effects have faded will be its influence. Prehistoric planet and everything else is derived from it, and that can be embraced rather than skirted around. Planet Earth 2 wasn't invalidated by private lives. It's better for it for laying the groundwork. If you'll indulge me in some pretentious tinfoil hattery too, I think my issues, which may not even be an issue for many, lie in the foundations of Prehistoric Planet, in those producers making it. I did enjoy Favreau's Jungle Book, but I did remember reading one review saying they believed the whole thing was just a glorified audition tape for him to work on Star Wars, and yeah, they called that pretty well. Similarly, there's Favreau's comments about how the first thing you do with new image visualization techniques is make dinosaurs with them, and how it seems he thought after everyone praised his photorealistic Disney animals, he decided he had to make photorealistic Disney dinosaurs. On the side of the BBC, some now feel the documentaries are less about animals, education, and documenting nature, and more about showing off their glamorous new camera technology in 45-minute reels of glorified hypnotic scenery porn. And there is a point to this. Documentaries as a format don't need sequels, as they don't have a flowing narrative between seasons. They are their own form of content that can be the same thing again but under a new title or episode. Much of the more recent productions can deliver better shot, but often ultimately less interesting content, sometimes even filming the same thing twice in the ultimate display of showing off their new toys, and only occasionally getting a new sequence that truly exceeds older content. Prehistoric Planet isn't just a post-Walking With product, it's a post-Planet Earth product, the particular broadcast that led to the full cinemification of nature documentaries and especially BBC ones. Again, even when it's not directly rotoscoping scenes, 
prehistoric planet is clearly trying to recapture such vibes with its cinematography. It's not enough to just be good, you have to recognise it as a natural history unit product, hence the Attenborough. In Planet Earth 2, the most seminal scene, that was legitimately excellent, was the race of snakes pursuing the baby iguanas in the Galapagos, with some even saying it was the best television scene ever. Let's not go nuts. And while you can tell Mike Gunton took those positive remarks to heart, Prehistoric Planet has three such gauntlet scenes, with lone, wide-eyed newborns fleeing between the lip-smacking predators and a few more that are also reminiscent of this, albeit with variation. The Alcyone Hatchlings and Isosaurus were both solid sequences informed and utilising the science, but by the time of the Swamps episode with the Azdarchid Flaplings, it had overstayed its welcome. And even worse, this was also a clear reference to another BBC scene that ultimately added little to the episode. In short, Prehistoric Planet feels like it's trying to recapture the essence of the BBC's greatest hits to date as its top priority. And so it doesn't just lack Walking with Dinosaurs originality, it lacks its sincerity too. The goal of that documentary was to quote a natural history of dinosaurs, full stop. No showing off your tech demos, no desire to recreate your greatest hits album. This doesn't make Walking With perfect, even as the trendsetter, before anyone thinks I'm trying to claim that. Both documentaries are simultaneously propelled and held back by the time period they're released in. The bedrock of what Gunton and Favreau want Prehistoric Planet to be didn't necessarily hamstring it, but definitely changed it from what I at least would consider its maximum potential. But they're not the only ones working on it, and Prehistoric Planet had a number of visual artists, skilled camera operators, and experienced paleontologists working on it, whose dedication shines through in every scene. Ultimately, and just for me personally, I can't agree with it being the greatest paleo media ever, mostly because that's an impossible and ephemeral title. But as such, thanks to the work of everyone involved, it'll just have to settle for merely being excellent instead. Thanks for watching, and thanks to top patrons Phenomenon and the Superist Duper for their support in keeping the channel going, as well as Kay Sandom, Big Al, Erengar Steiny, Flygon's Archives, Sassy Birdo, Inventory Overflow, Tristan Berry, Eveleth, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fake Class Names, Aesir, Karazal, Dodecablos, and Bazugazu Bakuhatsu Bakumatsu for their ongoing generosity. I wasn't sure whether I was going to review Prehistoric Planet 2, as it's more just an extension of Season 1, and a lot of content that was initially cut. But when I sat down to write what was initially going to be a community post, I decided it was too big, and decided to make it a video instead. So do let me know what your own thoughts on Prehistoric Planet 2 were. It's unknown if we'll be getting a direct Season 3, but there have been some positive comments made by the various producers, so fingers crossed for more paleo content of this quality, even if I do still have my gripes with it. I just made this video relatively quickly with minimal formatting, in the hope of doing that whole releasing the video when its content will actually be relevant thing. But after this, business as usual again, and Ludroth is still being made. Hopefully I'll see you there for it.